Good morning, dear friends. As we are coming to the eve of the Feast of Mercy, we celebrate that mercy in the Lord's presence. We thank Jesus for what he has in store for us. We believe what the Lord has in store for us. Praise God. If we do not believe what the Lord has in store for us, we will never receive what the Lord has in store for us. If we don't have belief in what the Lord has in store for us, at times we will not even pray for what the Lord has in store for us. So when we sit here in the presence of Jesus, let there be a prayer in your heart, let there be faith in our heart as well. And let there be anticipation of the Lord's mercy filling and flooding our souls. Praise God. Let there be anticipation. You sit in anticipation, not in sadness or grief, but in excitement. When you are to receive something special, you wait in excitement. And at present, your faces show no excitement at all. <laughs> you look like you're sitting in fear. <laughs> Sit in anticipation. Sit in excitement. Sit like you know that the battle will be won by the Lord. That is the way we should sit in God's presence. I don't know if you play, if you play cards. You play cards? Yeah. So if you play cards and, you know, the ones who, who play, uh, who know the game very well, and they know what their hand is. And sometimes you get a hand where you know that whatever the other does, it doesn't matter. You know you're going to win the game. You just know the hand is so good. You know you have the trump card with you. And you sit there with great confidence in your mind thinking you can play whatever you want to play. I know what I have with me. That is the kind of confidence with which we should sit in the Lord's presence. I know who is with me. And that confidence I have, for I know ultimately I will win the battle because the Lord will be by my side. Praise God. Praise God. So sit with that anticipation. Don't sit in fear. Don't sit like you have already lost before the game has begun. So often the, the way we sit in church reflects our faith as well. We sit more in fear than in confidence. Always come to church believing in the confidence of God's mercy. Not in the confidence of what you have achieved in life or in the confidence of how good you were. Because however good we are, we will not come up to the goodness of God. We will not match up. We strive towards, but we will not match up. So we cannot come with our goodness or with our acts of charity and our acts of great holiness and piety and think that we can balance it out and win the battle. We can never balance it out and win the battle, however good you are. So it is not, oh Lord, I have been a good person. I have fasted all through Lent. Now it's time, pay back. <laughs> oh Lord, I came for all the divine mercy novena. You know, day one, day two, day three, day nine. I'm here, I've traveled so far and I've come. And I've sat through some of those most boring sessions of his. Now, payback. If you're going to wait for payback, then you're going to lose out. 
but wait in anticipation with the confidence of God's mercy. The reason I keep saying that, the confidence of God's mercy, it is because God's mercy is not based on your merit. And so you can sit in confidence that God will pour out His mercy upon us. Praise God. The mercy of God is not a new concept. It didn't start with St. Faustina. It became popular with St. Faustina, but it didn't start with St. Faustina. All through the scriptures, we have references to God's mercy. All through the scriptures. There's references to God's mercy. Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, I will show mercy to whom I want to show mercy. Praise God. I will show mercy to whom I want to show mercy, says the Lord. Now, this is an answer to those of us who feel that God is unfair. At times, you will see the person who rarely comes to church getting blessed. They seem to be succeeding. They seem to be climbing the ladder of success. They're the ones who end up getting the promotions. The promotion, you came and you prayed for so much and you desired so much. And then you felt bad and you thought, why is God so unfair? These people barely come to church. Maybe the ones in your own family, they refuse to come to church and good things happening to them. You're in church all the time and nothing seems to be happening. And we are upset with God. Remember Exodus 33, the Lord says, I will be merciful to whom I want to be merciful. Who are you to ask? Who are you to ask? Mercy belongs to him. He gives it to whoever he pleases. Praise God. You know, if you have inheritance, your father works and he works hard. And he has got an inheritance and you and your siblings are waiting for the inheritance. Do you do that? No, Singapore, you don't have passing on of inheritance. Your father gives your brother a major portion and leaves you with a pitiful little. Would you be upset? Can't hear you. <laughs> Would you be upset? So shameless we are. <laughs> I can understand if it is an inheritance that has come from generation to generation to generation, and then your father giving it to one and not giving it to the other can maybe, you know, tickle your senses. That's fine. But when your father does all the hard work, he makes all his money, and he gives what he has made to whom he wants, and you've done nothing for it, what sense does that make? You're sitting upset. So he says, it is mine, not my father's, it is mine, I made it, I will give it to whom I please. The same with mercy. It is his he will give it to whomsoever he pleases to give it. Praise God. Don't sit upset. Don't sit thinking, oh, now the guy who's sleeping is going to get it. The person who doesn't come to church is going to get it. No, rather think, oh, wow, that means I have a chance. Sit thinking that I have a chance because the Lord's mercy is not merited. 
So it is his nature. This is not something new that suddenly God decided with St. Faustina. He saw her and then decided, you know, now suddenly my, my great attribute of mercy is suddenly going to come out. No, he's always been merciful. He's always been merciful. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 19 to 19 and 31. God in his mercy never forsake us. The book of wisdom, 11, 23. You are merciful to all. The book of Baruch, 3, 2. Have mercy, Lord, for we have sinned. Mercy is not a new concept. Mercy has always been the Lord's attribute. But what happened with St. Faustina was the Lord told her, re-emphasize my mercy because they have forgotten my greatest attribute. They have forgotten my greatest attribute. Why? Because we generally tend to remember the wrath of God and the anger of God and the punishments of God. Praise God. Praise God. I'll tell you how that plays out in our life. When we do something wrong, something wrong happens to us. Something that maybe in our physique or in our family or, or in our career, something wrong happens. Immediately our thought is, what did I do wrong that God has allowed this to happen? What have I done wrong? The moment your life is going on perfectly well, the job is going on perfectly well, the business is going on perfectly well, and suddenly there is a fall in the business. What is our first thought? Oh, what did I do wrong? Why did this happen to me? We are so scared without even realizing it. We are so scared of the wrath and anger of God. So then we start trying to please God. Then you come to church a little more often. You pray a bit more. Then you have a few novenas, like Father was telling me. The novenas to the Blessed Mother are the most popular ones. And you go, you have the Novena Church here, right? Yeah. What is the name of the church? Sorry? Saint? Saint Alphonsus is the Novena Church. Oh, poor Saint Alphonsus. <laughs> now, I've heard about the Novena Church from the time, from the first time I've come here, to, to Singapore, and uh, uh, some of my friends have taken me to the Novena Church as well. And everywhere, it's the Novena Church, it's the Novena Church. Oh, poor St. Alphonsus. <laughs> Might as well rechristen that church. <laughs> The Novena Church. So now, let's make the Novenas. When we do the Novena, something good's going to happen to us. Let us please the Lord. Let me come. Let me kneel in a way that the Lord will accept the pain of my body. And then he will bring in a great blessing upon me. This attitude of trying to please God is an attitude where we are actually afraid of God's wrath or God's anger. And so we believe, I need to please God. But God's mercy reveals to us that His greatest attribute is given to us irrespective of the merits that we have spiritual or physical. And that is why Jesus tells St. Faustina, re-emphasize 
that my greatest attribute is mercy. Praise God. We re-emphasize this because we have forgotten. Remind them, rem let them remember that my greatest attribute is mercy. You need to be reminded is when you have forgotten. Praise God. Praise God. You need to be reminded when you have forgotten, when somewhere it is lost. I remember I was the, when I was in the seminary, I was the secretary to uh, principal of the, of the seminary and uh, of the theologate. And when I took over, he, wonderful priest, amazing priest, a great theologian, and, um, uh, but a person who was a bit messy. You know, many of these geniuses, they, they are a bit messy. Now, if your child's room is messy, be happy. <laughs> Find some comfort there. You know, maybe there's a genius hidden somewhere in him. So, um, uh, he, he was a bit messy. So, when you enter into the principal's office, his table would be there. And his table was just one big lump of mess. That's the principal's table. It literally was like a mountain. Lots of books and lots of papers and everything. Some open, some closed. Everything there, the pens there. So I took over as secretary when I was in my first year, I think. I took over as secretary in my, in my theology. So I was a seminarian. And I looked at this mess, and I thought, oh, gosh, look at the mess. And uh, I had to get the timetable. I tried to look for the timetable. I couldn't find the timetable. So I sat for one full week every day in the morning for two hours. I typed out the whole timetable, the whole year's timetable. And after I did that, I printed it, and I placed it very nicely for the principal to see. You know, and to congratulate me. Well done, Michael. You've done a good job. He walks inside. He looks at the timetable. And he says, Oh, you've been typing this. I said, Yes, Father. He said, It was here all throughout. And he went to his table and he put his hand inside all that mess. <laughs> and there he pulled it out. <laughs> The whole timetable I was typing for one full week. <laughs> Some things go hidden. And we need to pull it out. The mercy of God so often goes hidden. The wrath, anger, judgment of God is what we speak about so often. But this is where the Lord tells St. Faustina, remind them, remind them that my greatest attribute is mercy, 301 of the diary of St. Faustina. Your lotto numbers are four? <laughs> okay. Thank God for the 301s. <laughs> that is why you don't seem very interested when I said the 301. <laughs> Father, give us the four-digit ones. Let's. Mercy is my greatest attribute, says the Lord. Mercy is my greatest attribute. On the 22nd of Feb, 1931, when he appears to St. Faustina, he tells them, God pleads to avail of his mercy. God pleads pleads to avail of his mercy. What does that mean? That means it is there. Come and avail of it. But we need to come. We need to ask for. We need to come to the font of mercy. Praise God. I was very interested in your church here. The first day I came over here, I looked at this board, and I thought, what's wrong with these people? 
they make an amazing church and they go and put a plywood on top. <laughs> Till when I was getting into the lift every day and, and your lifts are very decorative because lots of information is there inside the lift. So I was looking and I saw these priests, the three priests over here who are dipping little ones here in the font. So this is your baptismal font, isn't it? Amazing baptismal font. I've never seen something like this. Beautiful. An amazing um, baptismal font. Now this baptismal font is there over here. If you sit right behind and you decide, I want baptism, but I'm not coming out here, the church is telling you, here, come, a whale of what is there over here. If you sit behind and say, no, I'm sitting here and I'm not getting what I want, the church tells you, come and avail of what is there. You can avail of only what is available. And what is available by the Lord is mercy. And the Lord says, come and avail that mercy. Come and receive that mercy that I give you. Anyone who comes to the font of my mercy will receive and they will never go back disappointed. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And that mercy will flow right through us into every part of our being, starting from the beautiful bodies that God has given us. It will flow through. Let's read 651 of the Diary of St. Faustina. I've come equipped with all the three-digit ones today. <laughs> so in the Diary of St. Faustina, if you, have, if you don't have the Diary of St. Faustina, please get it. It's, it's, not, it's not a diary that you just read for, you know, for recreational reading. But for beautiful spiritual reading, taking just one, one paragraph at a time in a day. Even if the paragraph is really tiny, just one a day, and it will really, really enrich us. There's 651 of the diary says, Mercy is the flower of love. God is love and mercy is his deed. God is love and mercy is his deed. It's his action. His love translating into action is mercy. So whenever we pray and we speak of God's mercy, the deed, when we speak of God's love, the deed is God's mercy. And that is why so, uh, so beautifully when the Lord speaks about the, the image of mercy. I don't know if anybody has explained to you about the image of mercy. It's beautiful, the explanation of the, the image of mercy. And one of the things the Lord says is, my gaze from this image is the gaze that I had from the cross. My gaze in the image of mercy is my gaze from the cross. And you would think, why? Because the image is not the crucified Jesus. It's the resurrected Jesus. The gaze of, from the cross is a gaze of triumph of mercy. It's a gaze of triumph of mercy. So when I look into the image of mercy and Jesus' eyes in the image of mercy, from there comes forth the gaze of mercy. He's looking at me with mercy. His love that is portrayed on the cross is now translated into this gaze of mercy. And therefore, his love is translated in deeds of mercy. Those deeds of mercy are for us, upon us, upon our bodies as well. 
in 301 of the diary. 301 of the diary, the Lord says, All my works of my hands are crowned with my mercy. All the work of my hands are crowned with my mercy. Praise God. Praise God. That means whatever the Lord does, there will be a hand of mercy on it. Whatever the Lord does, when he touches your body, there will be his hand of mercy on it. Praise God. Praise God. So you give your ailing, your weak bodies to Jesus. Pray, Lord, I don't merit a healing. I'm not worth a healing. But let your hand of mercy rest upon me. And let your love translate into deeds of mercy. All your acts, O oh Lord, are crowned with your mercy. Your act of touching me, let it be crowned with your mercy. Touch and heal my ailing and weak body. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. In Mark chapter 5, we read about the woman with hemorrhage. How many years did she suffer? I can't hear you. Twelve years. Twelve years she suffered. She went everywhere. It says she went to all the doctors for 12 years and she spent all her money. And then what happened? I can't hear you. Yes, what happened? Yes, what happened? Broke. She was broke exactly. That is when you come to the Lord. If she had a little more money, she would have gone to the next doctor. That is what we do, don't we? From the doctor to the next doctor to the next doctor to the next doctor till we are broke. I was asking them, in Singapore, does the government give you free, um, free medical treatment? No. If only they did, we would have still been in the hospital, Father, not here in church. <laughs> it's when we run out of options. She ran out of options. She had no other option. No money, nothing left behind. She comes. She walks amongst the crowd. And she goes and touches the... Touches the, she touches the hem of his garment. She touches the hem of his garment, touches the hem of his mercy. She's touching the hem of his garment. His mercy is flowing and his mercy is flowing and his mercy is flowing. And she goes and touches the hem of his mercy. And immediately the Lord stops. The Lord didn't ask her, why didn't you go to the next doctor? <laughs> the Lord asks, who touched me? And she was scared. In the end, no one else is raising their hand. Then she says, me, go, your faith has made you well. You have touched not just the hem of the Lord's garment, you have touched his mercy. Anyone who touches the Lord's mercy will never be devoid of his mercy. It will flow through your body. I remember a priest who loves the divine mercy a lot now, but he spoke to me, when he spoke to me, he told me, Father, there was a time I detested 
this, this devotion of the divine mercy. Because I felt it was just a promotion by John Paul II because of the Polish connection. So I detested it. And it was all these, these um, um, the diary and everything within. Now, the diary of St. Faustina actually speaks so much about repentance, about conversion of the heart. And he said, I thought it was just a bit too much. I found it difficult to accept this devotion. He said, I was an alcoholic. And he was admitted into the hospital with cirrhosis of the liver. A diabetic as well, and therefore he had a wound on his leg. When he was admitted into the hospital, he was in a pretty serious condition. There was, um, the doctors were deciding to amputate his, his leg because the wound wasn't healing. And the cirrhosis of the liver was pretty bad. And he said, there were nurses over there. Now, this person isn't from Kerala. Um, I'm from Kerala. So he was speaking to me specifically because of those nurses from Kerala. And this is in a um, uh, Western country. I won't tell you where the country is. Is only because these nurses were not supposed to be doing what they were doing in that hospital. They would go and sit next to each patient and they would pray the divine mercy. Now, in certain countries, that has been banned. You're not supposed to say prayers when you are dealing with the patients. So they would sit, especially with those patients who have no consciousness or in the last stages, they would sit and they would pray. This priest described to me three of them. He said, three young ones. The first day they came to me and they said, Father, can we pray for you the divine mercy? And he felt very offended. One, because he's the priest, so he should be the one praying. <laughs> and he said, most probably they saw me sit lying on that bed, barely praying at all. So they came and told me, Father, can we pray for you? And then out of all the prayers, they chose divine mercy. And he said, I detested divine mercy. And these, these nurses sat there and said, Father, please, we'll just say the prayer. He was initially against it. He told them he, he's not interested. They said, Father, we'll just say it for five minutes quickly and we'll go off. And they would take turns in coming to him, these three of them. They would take turns in coming to him and praying the divine mercy chaplet every day with this priest. Because he was not able to get up and go, he sat and he bore up with it. But after three weeks of treatment over there, when the doctors were deciding to amputate his feet, the wound on his feet started healing. And the doctors came back and said, we can't understand because you are not responding to any of the medication. But your body is healing. The wound is healing. That priest left the hospital a month and a half later, completely healed, not only of his feet, but also of the cirrhosis of his liver. And he came to me and he was speaking to me, saying, I am now passionate about the divine mercy. A priest who needed to be taught about the divine mercy by three young nurses. But when we come to the font of the Lord's mercy and we touch the hem of his mercy, he covers us with his mercy. Your body, the Lord covers with his mercy. But remember, the Lord's mercy is not only for your body, for your ailing organisms within you from the very core of your being, your soul, your emotions, your heart. Take the scriptures when, when Jesus comes to the man who's paralyzed for 38 long years by the pool of Bethsaida. John chapter 5, 38 years the man was paralyzed. 
Jesus comes to him and asks him, do you want to be made? Do you want to be made well? Let me ask you, do you want to be made well? Praise God. So many other questions I asked you. All those questions I had to ask twice. <laughs> this is the only question I got an immediate answer. <laughs> Do you want to be made well? Yes. So easy, isn't it? What an easy answer to give. Jesus asked the man, Do you want to be made well? Oh no, he didn't say yes. His answer was so different. He said, Lord, I have no one. Lord, I have no one. It wasn't a yes, it wasn't a no. Rather, he's telling Jesus, 38 years I've been lying over here. 38 years I looked forward for healing. Maybe the first few years my family stood by me. And then they went on with their life. And I've been lying here for 38 years. I have no one. It is a heart that is broken. It is a heart that is broken. More than the body that is broken, it is the heart that is broken. The Lord tells him, stand up. Take your mat. Go home. He wasn't just standing from his physical paralysis. It was his broken heart that got healed that day. God's mercy touched his heart. God's mercy will touch your heart. The heart that is wounded, the heart that has been rejected, the heart that has been hurt, the heart that has been destroyed, the heart that has been insulted, come to the font of my mercy. And I will fill you with my mercy, says the Lord. Not only for your physical body, but for your wounded heart. For your disturbed emotions. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You know, there's in John chapter, John chapter 4, there is the Samaritan woman. You know the Samaritan woman? You know the story, right? The woman who came to the well at noon to collect water. Isn't it odd to come at noon to collect water? Yes or no? What time would someone really collect water from the well? When? How do you know? Out of all the places in Singapore. <laughs> Do you actually have even one well? Have you ever seen a well here in Singapore? Yeah? You better show me that well, other than this one. <laughs> Is there water inside this now? Oh, nothing. Oh, okay. The empty well. <laughs> she comes by noon because she doesn't want anybody to speak about her. They gossip about her. Jesus is waiting there. Jesus looks at her and says, I want a drink. And she immediately responds, you a, Samar you a Jew asking a Samaritan? This doesn't seem right. And they have a nice theological discussion there. And then Jesus hits her where it hurts the most. The Lord asks her, go and call your, go and call your husband. And what is our answer? I have no husband. That's the best way to end the conversation. I have no husband. And the Lord says, that's true. You have had five. Imagine five. She tried the first one, not good enough. Tried the second one, not good enough. Like someone told me when I said, we shall have oil change for the marriage. Can we have spouse change as well? Renewal. 
She tried one, not good enough. She tried the second, not good enough. Third, fourth, fifth. And he says, you've been married to five. And the one you're living with now is not even your spouse. Six of them she's tried. She's a person with a broken heart. She's trying one to fill, fill the emptiness within her, not happy. Second one, fill the emptiness within her, not happy. That is what we do as well. One friend, second friend, one relationship, next relationship. We are busy trying to fill empty spaces within our heart. Six times she tried, got nowhere. And then the Lord presented himself. In the Israelite tradition, seven is a complete number. Six times. That is why when you have the wedding at Cana, how many jars were filled? Six jars were filled. Where is the seventh jar? Jesus is the seventh jar. Seven is a complete number. Six times she's been trying. Jesus now presents himself as the most perfect spouse. She is now filled with his mercy. Where does she go? Where does she go? She goes to the village. And she tells those same people who she is scared of. My heart is satisfied. I have found the Messiah. Not only the body, the emotion, the heart, and more so, our souls are touched by the mercy of God. Our souls are touched by the mercy of God. Dear brothers and sisters, one thing know in your, in your heart and in your mind, most of all, our bodies are beautiful gifts of God, but most of all, the Lord is concerned about the state of your soul. Most of all, the Lord is concerned about the state of your soul. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We read in 1588, that has four digits. 1588. The Lord says, I do not want to punish aching mankind, but I desire to heal it, pressing it to my merciful heart. I bring your soul and I press it to my merciful heart, says the Lord, so that your soul will not be lost. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. 1076, I bring everything into the bowels of my mercy. 1076, I bring everything into the bowels of my mercy. And the Lord describes it and says, more deeply than an infant in its mother's womb. Praise the Lord. How many of you are mothers? Can you raise your hands? All the mothers? Only half mothers? <laughs> mothers, raise your hands. You look like tired mothers. <laughs> One of the deepest relationships. Sorry, the gents. I know that nowadays, uh, nowadays they have this um, new concept where they, um, you know, couples go around and saying, we are pregnant. Yeah, so it's a husband and the wife both going through the pregnancy. We are pregnant. But let's be really, really practical. You know, <laughs> I mean, you don't even know 1% of the pain she's going through. Or even 1% of the emotions she's going through. Agreed, it is your seed. I agree. But, you know, let's be real, real about this. You're not pregnant. She is pregnant. She feels deep within her. Isn't that true, mothers? I don't know. I'm, I'm presuming. 
You should know better. <laughs> Isn't that true? You're so attached. At no point, this, this so-called man, the husband, who says, we are pregnant, we are pregnant, when he goes out and he's with his friends, he's not bothered. <laughs> he's not busy thinking, oh, I should be careful about what I eat, what I drink. <laughs> oh, my little one. <laughs> but she feels it. In everything that she is, she feels it deep within. She cannot forget that she's pregnant. And look at how the Lord is describing this when he says, Everything that exists is enclosed in the bowels of my mercy more deeply than an infant in its mother's womb. Your soul is in the bowels of the Lord's mercy so deeply far more than a mother can know her child. Our souls are so precious to the Lord. And that is why he says, come to the font of my mercy. And so the Lord actually says, Satan's greatest enemy is God's mercy. Satan's greatest enemy is God's mercy. In 1, 2, 7, 3. Satan hates mercy more than anything else. It is his greatest torment. Why? Because the soul that is getting lost will just about be saved because of God's mercy. When he thinks that he's going to get a grip, right from his hands, the Lord will steal the soul that is getting lost. He did it at Calvary. He stole a soul from a thief. And he took him to heaven. Dear brothers and sisters, when we are here, we're going to enter into the moments of the adoration. We will pray for healing. But when you pray for healing, don't just pray for the healing of your bodies. Our bodies are what it is. It will, even if it's healed today, tomorrow it will get sick with something else. And ultimately one day, we will die. And then we will celebrate the fact that our souls we're in the Lord's hand. And we are in God's kingdom because he protected my soul. You should be able to pray, Lord, if you don't give me healing, I don't mind. If you don't, don't give me blessings, I don't mind. If you don't give me financial graces, I don't mind. If you don't give me an answer to any of the petitions I put, I don't mind. But Lord, don't give up on my soul. That should be our greatest prayer. Lord, don't give up on my soul. Let my soul never be lost. One of the little ones, I don't know if she's here tonight, um, this today, but they came here and, and the mother asked me, asked the children to tell me the prayer that they make. Is the mother there here with the little ones who prayed? I don't know if they're there. But the... The child's prayer, tiny, tiny little one. You can see, tiny, tiny. She told me what her daily prayer is. Lord, let me not be lost. Teach your children to pray those prayers. Lord, let me not be lost. Let my soul be protected. That is the greatest gift of divine mercy. When we will triumphantly enter into God's kingdom, and there we will be able to declare, God's mercy has triumphed. A sinner has been saved. A soul is in God's presence. Praise God. Praise God.